Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let me erase the board because I ran a little bit over my last class class. So I want to talk about, um, I think, what well, I think for a lot of the engineering students, it's a fun lab. I guess if you're not an engineering student, this might not be a fun lab. I don't know. Uh, you're going to be building a motor for me. Okay. You're going to be building something called a DC motor. This lab is due on the 30th. And what you're going to do is create a video for me showing how th that the motor is working. Uh, let me take a look at Jacob's question. I have, I have mine on gallery. So I can see everybody. Jacob. Okay, so yeah, regards to your question, Jacob, I have mine on gallery. I just pinned it, so thanks for reminding me. Okay, um, so this is doing the 30th, but don't wait on, until the 30th, because if you do, you are close to the 30th, you're going to be in trouble. Okay. Um, let me show you what comes in your kit. In your kit, you should have a bag. Hold on, I gotta be able to see myself on the screen, sorry. I have too many windows open. In your kit, you should have a bag. Um, and in the bag, you should have a few parts in it. One is a block of wood, which forms the base of your motor. And I'm going to show you some example of motors in a little bit. So don't, I mean, just, just be patient with me and I'll, and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll show you some examples of student motors. So this will be the base of the motor that you're going to be building. Um, you're going to have, uh, a, a bunch of wire. Yours is probably orange based on what the class said before us. Uh, they said it was orange. Mine's green. The, the, your orange is the, the reason why it's orange is because number one, it's copper, but then number two, it's coated. Okay. The wire is coated so you can make multiple wrappings. You can actually wrap it without having problems, conductivity problems. Okay. So yours will probably be orange. You will have a bunch of nails to help you build the motor. You should have electrical tape. And you have instructions on how to build the motor. Detailed step-by-step -step instructions how to build a motor. You don't have to build the motor exactly like this. Students over the years have made minor changes to it to make it work better. Okay. And, and as, we go, as we go through the lab over the next couple of weeks, if, as you have questions, um, I, I can, we can talk about what kind of modifications you can make. So one of the things students have used is bearings. You can use your own bearings to make this, to make this work better. Okay. So make sure you have that kit with you. Now, I, I ought to warn you about the magnet wire. This is why I want you to do this early. I want you to get started now. 
I mean, you can, you can build this while, while you're watching TV, okay? You can be wrapping uh, wire, etc., as you're watching TV. If you screw up and you need more wire, it's going to be, it might be kind of hard to get new wire. You won't be able, it's going to be hard for you to buy it. Um, if you try to order it um, online from Amazon, it might take you a while to get it. And typically, you might have to order a big spool. And I can't remember locally where you can get this wire other than McMaster Car. No, I'm sorry, Granger. I think Granger is off of 80. In, uh, near, is, is it, I think it's off of 80 near Greenback or something like that. Okay. And you'd have to go, go there and, and pick it up probably. Um, this is expensive. Okay. You can also, if you get started early, just, and you have problems with this wire, just contact Tyler. He might have some extra wire he might make, uh, he can give to you. Okay, this stuff is crucial. If this, this is hard to replace. Nails are easy to replace. You can always buy nails at Home Depot. A block of wood is easy to replace. This is hard to mess up though. Okay, the electric pole tape you can buy at Home Depot. But this magnet wire is hard to replace. So, so be careful with it. Get started now. Because this takes time to replace. Okay? So now that I've said that, if you come to me two days before the lab is doing, you started it, uh, I'm going to say that, that, you know, that's your problem. Okay? You, I, you can't say I didn't warn you to, to get started now. Okay? All right. So those are the parts you're going to be using for the, to build the motor. It's fairly straightforward. And I've done this lab for both Physics 110 and, and, and this course. But there's a difference between the requirements in this course in Physics 110. Physics 110, they just have to build it and make it work. For you guys, you have to build it and make it work under a certain voltage. So when you look at the lab, oh yeah, there's also two batteries. If the, the motor runs on two batteries, you get full credit on that part of the lab. So the lab is in two parts. There is um, 10 points is on answering five questions in the lab. There are 30 points is on the motor itself. Three volts, okay? If you do a good job building this motor and it runs on three volts, you should see if it runs on, on one battery. For some reason, when, when we've gone online, students have not tried to build the best motor they can. They just get the, the three volts and that's it. But when we're on campus, students try to compete against each other to see who gets the lowest voltage, okay? Uh, so if, you're, if your motor runs really well, at three volts, you should actually take out one of the batteries, see if it runs on one battery, and film that. Okay. We've had motors run under one volt. Okay, and, and when we're on campus, we actually have a power supply that can drive the system at um, or whatever current that, that's needed. You guys don't have power supplies. Most of you guys don't have power supplies, okay, to be able to test your motors. But on campus, we do. And so um, when we're on campus, my, my stipulations are actually a little, little steeper. When, when we do this lab on campus, to get the full 30 points, you have to run this at 2 volts or less. Okay, but because we're not on campus, I made it 3 volts. Because the, 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 the motor is designed to run for 3 volts. Okay. If you need more voltage, then go to the store and buy more D-cell batteries. Okay, do not use, and I, I, I shouldn't say that, but I don't recommend you using the little power supply that you use for the Ohm's Law Lab. 
because if you try to use too big a voltage you're going to try to draw too much current and that little power supply might not be able to supply the current that's needed okay I would if, if you need more volt if you think you need more voltage don't go above six volts for now so you might want to buy two more diesel batteries and hook them up in series with the you know with the other ones you can just use tape to tape them together um, the reason why you don't want to go above six volts is because when you go above six volts the current is going to be significant the wires the magnet wire will get hot the enamel coating might melt and then you've just screwed up your your motor okay the key to be being able to have a motor that works um, well is to make sure that everything is wound very nicely I'm going to show you some examples of motors in a bit so before I go on are there any questions really quickly you sent out an updated version of the lab would you like us to transfer everything over to that version of it and submit it no you don't have to okay it just that it's just so that you know what my expectations are you don't have to do that right right okay thank you okay let me so quick... I'm, go ahead i'm looking at the lab right now and it says like at the bottom um motor operating voltage and then verified by yeah it's gonna be me i guess okay yeah normally so normally when we do it on camp i never got rid of that normally when we do it on campus uh, it'll be either me or tyler or shakal or you know whoever's in the lab so so when we're on campus you're going to go up to some a faculty member and say can you uh check my motor and then we verify it and we sign it we sign our name actually on the motor but we can't do that now so next semester, actually next fall, I'm going to do this lab in person. I, may, I was able to get permission to do some of the labs in person. So I will do this one in person. That's how I'm going to do it next fall. So yeah, when you look at the lab, and I want to show you this real quick. Uh, here are the questions you're going to answer. These are worth two points each for a total of 10 points. And then here are your stipulations. Okay, this is how I'm going to assign points for the motor part of the lab. And then I have rules for how your uh, motor should be connected. Uh, your, all your connections should be in series, not parallel. And then you just got to show me a video showing me the wire that shows the wiring of the motor that the motor can spin on its own. You, you, you can give the motor an initial push, okay, but then it should run on its own. It should show me the operating voltage of the motor. So if, if it's running on two diesel batteries, it's three volts or less. Uh, you must show yourself in the video and your name must appear on the base of the motor. So follow, the, follow those instructions in bold there. Okay. And then you're going to submit these answers. And that's it. This is this in terms of the lab report it's pretty short okay so here's a picture of the motor what it should look like when you when you built it okay and you have instructions that come with if you don't have instructions let me know okay no uh, you want to type Jacob you want to type your answers in this document so type your answers in this document and sub upload the document okay all right so um, let's talk a little bit about the motor so I got, I'm going to go through a little bit of physics that we're probably going to cover today in lecture okay I'm going to so if you have questions regarding details about what I'm about to say, especially the first thing, I will probably answer them in lecture today. We need to understand a couple of things in order for us to understand how the motor works. So 
Let's first start by considering a, um, hold on a second, I'm missing one of my markers. Oh, here we go. Let's consider a wire carrying current I, the length of the wire is L, and it's in a magnetic field that points into the board. Okay. This wire will experience a force. Of course, this, what's, in, what's in this wire? Well, in this wire is a bunch of charges. So each one of those charges is going to experience a force. And the force will be given by this expression. L is a vector that goes from, that's directed from this point to this point. Okay. And it's a cross product. So the force is perpendicular to the direction of current NB. So if I were to, to uh, draw a right-handed coordinate system to figure out the direction of the force on this wire, let's see, what would I get? Uh, let me draw my right-handed coordinate system. And the magnetic fields into the board. The current is upward. Now, how does the right hand rule work for this? Well, I point my fingers in the direction Yeah, I point my fingers in the direction of the current and curl them towards the magnetic field, which is into the board. So I point my fingers in the direction of the current, curl them towards the magnetic field. My thumb points that way. So this wire would experience a force to the left. Now suppose I have a loop of wire Okay, I didn't draw it very symmetrical, okay? It's my bad And the loop of wire is there's some sort of support here, some sort of bearing. Now let's assume that the bearing is frictionless. Okay, the support is frictionless, so it's so it's, it's just holding it up so it doesn't doesn't fall over or whatever, okay? Is, there's no friction between the purple material and the and the loop of wire itself And let's suppose that the current Looks like this Okay, and just for a simplicity Let's pretend we have a magnetic field that's uniform, like this. So the, the magnetic field points from the north to the south. Let's assume it's uniform, so it just points left to right. So what happens here in this case? What happens to this loop of wire in the magnetic field? So let me draw, let me draw that wire. And I'm going to draw a right-handed coordinate system again. I have 
I pointing up, I have the magnetic field, the B pointing to the right, because the magnetic field lines go from north to south pole. What is the direction of the force? Well, I put my fingers in the direction of the current, and I gotta curl them towards the magnetic field. The magnetic field's that way, so I gotta go like this and curl them towards the magnetic field. My thumb points into the board, so the force is into the board. So the force on this wire, force on left wire, What about the force on the right wire? It'll be equal and opposite compared to the left wire. So it'll be out of the board, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is this is pointing to the so this is into the board, this is out of the board. So let me let's look at it from the top, okay? Let's take a look at it from the top, the top view. So this is so oh, top it, view. It's gonna get it to spin. Yeah, you're you you're that's right. Because if you look at it from the top, you have a force this way. Okay. And a force this way. They're equal but opposite. The sum of the forces is equal to zero, but what's not zero? Well, what's going to uh, what cause the, the spin? Torque? The torque. The torque is not zero here. The sum of the torques is not zero. And if I, you know, I can sum the torques about this point. Okay. So the sum of the torques is not zero here. So this thing is going to want to spin. So this whole thing is going to want to rotate. If you look at it from the top, it's going to want to rotate clockwise. Okay, it's going to want to rotate clock, so this thing is going to spin. This is part of a motor. This is called the armature. And if you're able to couple this spinning part of the motor to the outside world, this spinning part of the motor, motor this spinning part of the motor then would be able to do work on, on the, something in the outside world. This is an electric motor. An electric motor converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. And the focus here will be on the DC motor. I will also talk about the AC motor later on. There's other kind of motors, but my, my goal here is just to focus on here today is the DC motor. Okay, there's induction motors. There's all kind of better designs for motors, but I want to just talk about this, this particular design. So you get an idea of how a motor works and how to build it. Okay, so basically a motor is just a loop of wire that's rotating in a magnetic field. Because this current carrying wire is going to experience a torque and it's going to want to spin. And if you couple it to the outside world, then this armature, this loop of wire, this armature can do work on the outside world. Does that make sense? So let me show you an example of a motor. So I'm going to have to disconnect my microphone. My room today is very messy. I have to be careful where I walk around in my room. So this is a DC motor, and actually this, could, this is universal, this could run as AC or DC. Okay. So here's my motor. Let me show you a top view, let me disconnect this from the power so I can go through. This is actually pretty heavy. This is the top of the motor. Okay, so you can see uh, everything here. You know, this, is, this is the armature. This is the coil of wire over here that's going to rotate in the magnetic field. Okay, this is the coil of wire that's going to rotate in the magnetic field. 
So let me show you some important pieces of the motor. The, one of the main ones is called the armature. The armature is the, the, the loop of wire that's rotating in a magnetic field. Okay? So let me write that on the board. So, um, the main components, the armature, Then another component that's important is called the brushes. So the brushes are basically these guys, these pieces, that allow you to make the connection to the armature. It allows you to, to uh, basically send energy from the power supply to your armature. Let me rotate this again. Okay, that's just these pieces. In your lab, this is going to be an important part of making the motor work because you have to have good contacts. If you don't have good contacts, you're in trouble. Okay, so the brushes are an important component of your motor. Then the last important item is the electrical connection between the brushes, which is these guys, and the, the armature itself. This is called a commutator. So the last item is called a commutator. That's this one. So let me write that on the board. Actually, let me write the brushes. These are the three important components of your motor. Okay. Now I want to take a look at the commutator. Close up. Let me know if you notice anything interesting about the commutator. Let me take the brushes out. So this is the commutator. What do you notice about the commutator? That's anything? The screws. Where well, the screws are to make, yeah, the screws are, are if, you, if you see the screw and the wire there, that's for the electrical connection. But what else do you notice? You see the word split? You see that gap there? There's a gap on both sides. That gap is super important. You have to have that gap. You might say, well, why, why is that gap important? Anybody want to guess as to why the gap is important? Here. Let me go up to the board. Let me switch to this one. Kind of worried, worried. I'm going to lose power in my, in my room here. Suppose this thing flips by 180 degrees. What happens? Or right, this thing is spinning. What happens when it flips by 180 degrees? This wire will be here, and this wire will be here. So if it flips by 180 degrees, then the force on this wire, when it's on this side, in other words, it has something like this. Then the force will be like this. This force will be like this. What do you think is going to happen to the rotation when this thing flips by 180 degrees? The torque is going to be in the opposite direction. And so, what do you think the motor is going to do? It's going to go like this. 
You think that's of any use? If I have a motor, it just goes back and forth? Or do I want a motor to keep spinning in the same direction all the time? You want a motor to keep spinning in the same direction all the time. And so, with that split ring that you see, the split ring that you see in the commutator, what that does, it allows for the current to reverse directions when this thing flips by 180 degrees. So when this thing flips by 180 degrees, you get the same picture you got here. So that split ring is so important that if you don't have it, your motor will not work at all. It's completely use useless. And you'll get just a motor that does this. It'll just go back and forth and it's completely useless. So you need that split ring. But when you build your motor, you have to have that. Otherwise, you're, it won't work at all. Okay? So that's crucial in your lab. You just split ring comic And of course, the instructions tell you how to, how to, how to build it. Okay. Okay. Um, questions? Or maybe uh, I should show you how this thing, I should show you this in, in action. Uh, so, why if uh, you flip it by 180 degrees, uh, it will, like, it wouldn't rotate just the other way? Like, why does it only move that way? Like the way you show. When I when I had the split ring. No, with like without the split ring. Without the Why split would ring, it? If I flip this 180 degrees, your loop looks like this, right? Right. Then the torques are the torque is in the opposite direction. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. So I have. Is this is the split screen okay or do we want to go full screen? You want to go full screen? Anybody? So here's the power supply. It's gonna power my motor. Okay, I'm gonna turn it up to four four volts. I gotta make sure my electrical connect oh I gotta connect it. It ain't going to work without electrical connections. Okay, and even this thing, I'm going to have to give it a kick to get started. It's running at 4 volts. Well, let me get a little bit more juice there. It's running at 5 volts now. You're in a smaller, so you have less weight for it. You have, you have a lot less weight, so... Three volts should be sufficient. This is running on five volts, but I have a lot more weight than this thing. This motor weighs a ton. It's weird, it was, it was running better earlier this morning. I might blow a fuse here, let's see. Now I got it at six volts. Okay, so this is running as a DC motor. So let me turn it down. This motor also has another pair of commutators like this. Notice there's no split ring. If I put AC power in, into it, AC power actually directly change, changes the direction, so I don't need a split ring. So if I use AC power, this will work fine. I don't need a, I don't need a split ring. So now I'm running this as an AC motor. I didn't do it this morning, but if I connect this to my AC power, it should work. I don't have a bad context or what? It's not working very well. Okay, I 
it's not working. It's not working as AC. I got. I'd have to check what I'm doing wrong. I have to double check it anyway. But yeah, at some point I'll make it run as an AC motor. Okay. Questions so far? Has everyone's question been answered? Because I haven't been really, I haven't looked very closely at all the questions on the um, chat. If I didn't answer your question, just go ahead and ask. Cause, okay. Oh yeah, one of the things I forgot to mention regarding the this, this enamel wire, it's coated, so when you make the electrical connections, you're going to have to use sandpaper to get rid of the carbon. Okay, because otherwise you, you're, electric, you're not going to be able to make any electrical connections. Okay, so you're going to have to use sandpaper, which should have come with your kit also. And if you don't see the sandpaper, you can go on the people by sandpaper. Okay, so I've shown you this motor. I should show you some other motors that we've used in class. So let me take, since I'm done with this for today, let me get rid of this monster. And let me show you some other motors. Here's one. It was built, I think it was like, this was my first year I was here. 1999. This was a student built motor. This was built at around Halloween. So it had a Halloween theme to it. So I see uh, Frankenstein there. And uh, skeleton. Okay. But this is the one the student built. One of the things to realize when you're building this motor, this is what yours will look like. Of course, you can modify and make a bit nice if you want. Is you want to make sure that this distance is not too great. Okay. You don't want this distance between the armature and the magnet. This this is part of the electromagnet. These nails that go around the electromagnet here. Um, the nails are, are ferromagnetic, so they actually enhance the field due to the magnet. Okay. Um, this distance shouldn't be that far away. If you can make it close, that'd be great. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. This distance is important. This is between the armature and the nails is important. Some people will build a motor like this. Hold on a second. What's wrong with that? The force is being applied at an angle. Yeah, you want you want it to be like this, right? You want the armature to be in the magnetic field, correct? These are little things people do that you keep it from working. You gotta think when you're building this. You can't just, you know, follow a recipe. You're not, you're not, this is not a cookbook recipe. You gotta, gotta you're engineering something, so you gotta think try to make it run at a, at a lower enough voltage. Now this student actually did a nice job wiring the armature and wiring electromagnet. Why is it important to do to uh, wire it very nicely and symmetrically? Why is this important? As opposed to doing something like this. Which is just a mess. I mean, this was a The field mess. isn't even? Um, yeah, the field isn't even, but also the moment of inertia is... is higher. The, 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 the mass distribution is not symmetric. All right? you, you, want to, you want the moment of inertia to be small, right? Because if you make the moment of inertia small, then your angular acceleration is going to be larger. Okay? 
So you want you want your moment of motion to be smaller. So you want to wrap things nicely. So this person does a beautiful job wrapping the electromagnet, but not as good a job wrapping the armature. And it was important in this case because this person's armature is really big. This person used four nails. These electrical connections are kind of weird. The brush connections were kind of bad. One of the issues you got to deal with is make sure you have good connection. This one's kind of not that great. So this ran at five volts. Can you show the commentator? It's right there. It's made with wires. You can go buy copper tape at Home Depot probably and, and, and make a, a, a nice commutator. You don't have to use the ones shown in the uh, instructions. You see the commutator? Yeah, I, was, I just wanted to see what it looked like with, with the gap and everything. Yeah, that, that, that's a huge gap. You don't have to have that big a gap. And then the, the brushes, the connections are not that good. You do kind of want to use a stiffer wire for the brushes, but this one's kind of... Not that good. So, so having consistent connection between the commutator and the brushes is important, too. Okay. Now, another thing that's important is... Uh, when you wrap this, when you wrap the armature, you're going to have probably you're going to have like two layers. You need to make sure that the current is in the same direction in both layers. Same thing with the electromagnet. If you if your electromagnet has two layers, you got to make sure that the current produces a magnetic field in the same direction in the two layers, because if it does not the magnetic field will be zero. Those are things for you to watch out with. Now, as you're building this and you're testing it and you say it's not, it's not working, and you want to contact me, okay, you want to contact me about getting help, um, you will use the discussion board. Okay, I will not answer your question unless you post it on your question on the discussion board. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. I will not answer your question unless you post it on the discussion board. Why? Why do you think I'm making you do that? You're not the only one who's going to have that question. That's why. And I don't want to. I don't want to answer. 31 different emails saying, hey, it's not working. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to answer the same question multiple times. Now, I already have a discussion board created with questions that have been asked in the past. So you can take over the discussion board and look there. There's actually a video there that actually shows you a person building one of these. And there's also answers to other questions, tips, etc. So you look at what's on the discussion board now before you ask a question. Okay, what I'm trying to do is avoid answering the same question over and over again. Okay, because that's typically what's happened the last couple of semesters. And, and then I, I think it's best if you just don't work, you know, the idea is so that we can help each other. I'm also hoping that if you post a question in the discussion board, somebody else in the class can try to answer it. I know some people like to use Discord, but for this one, I really want you to use discussion board so I'm not answering the same question over and over again. Okay. And I want us to be able to help each other out. Okay. Because maybe somebody will, you know, somebody's not working for you, you can say what well, you try. Somebody else can say, well, I tried this. Let's see, you know, and, and just to give us an idea of what, what worked for them. Okay. Okay. So anyway, let me show you a third motor. This is another student motor. This one moves very nice and freely. This ran on two volts. Okay. This person, instead of using nails, he used something else. These are, they have to be ferromagnetic. Whatever you use in here has to be ferromagnetic for the armature and for the, for the magnet. Otherwise, it's not going to work. 
Okay. So this totally changed the design a little bit and it got it to work better. And I'm surprised because the, the, the connections here with the brushes are, are kind of uh, weak, but it worked. It ran at two volts. Okay. The bigger one ran on five volts. But, you know, look at how things are, how the armature was uh, wrapped. It was nice and neat. Okay. Notice he used a pen for the shaft. Is a big pen for a chef. Okay. Questions? Concerns? So are we okay? Do you have enough instructions to, to be able to build this motor and make it work at three volts? Here's a fun one. This is a common one you might see on one, but I think I left it connected so now it couldn't be better. I think I killed the battery. I killed the battery in this one. The battery's overheated, I think. I messed that one up, sorry. No other questions? So again, let me show you the the lad, I'm going to disconnect the, uh, the camera. And let me show you the other document, or the, the Word document. So the instructions are also in this lab. Right here, you know, it says here, the, the uh, items 2 through 7 will be supplied by the student that should be supplied for you. We, we've actually started buying the equipment and giving it to the students. So all the instructions are here. Um, again, if you want to modify the commutator, you can buy uh, copper tape from um, Home Depot or Lowe's and use that for your commutator. It's up to you. Okay, you can you can make it. Uh, you know, you can you can change things a little bit if you want. If you want to use bearings, feel free to use bearings. Um, basically, what you need to submit is a video, clearly showing that your motor is working and spinning on its own. You can always give it an initial push. Okay. Um, the Motor must be connected in series. The armature and the uh, electromagnet have to be connected in series. Problem with the parallel connection is you're gonna be drawing too much current. That's one of them. And then the other one is, it, it will naturally run on a lower voltage when it's in parallel. So I need to be able to see the wiring. I need to be able to see it's running on two, D, two D cell batteries or one. And if you get it working on one, then make, show me a video working on one battery. Okay. Like I said, in the, in the past, students get very competitive when they're on campus. They try to see who gets the lowest voltage. Okay. It's a little bit harder when it's online because I don't have a, you don't have a power supply to um, minimize the voltage it runs at. You must show yourself in the video and, and that board, that, you got to write your name on that board. And the motors you keep yourself. You don't return the motors, okay? We don't need those. When you return the lab kits, we don't want the motor back, okay? So I need to see your face in the video or else, otherwise it'll take off points. And then your name must be written on the motor. And I gotta be able to see it. Questions? Concerns? Oh yeah, and you also gotta submit to upload this. Everybody's okay? I'm going to close this window and
So uh, just as a re you know, re refresher, the DC motor is a device that will convert electrical energy to mechanical energy. It is a generator that works backwards. And I'm going to use that same device I showed you earlier to run as a, a generator. And basically, you can think of it as a loop of wire in a magnetic field. The armature, again, is the coil of wire mounted on a cylinder or a, this doesn't have to be a cylinder. It does the mechanical work. The commutator and the brushes, the brushes um, are basically the stationary contacts that rub against the commutator to transmit the electrical energy to the armature. And the, com the split ring commutator is designed so that when the loop rotates by 180 degrees, the current reverses direction. Because otherwise, if it doesn't, you're going to have this problem. And your motor will not work. Okay. So, I want to um, go back to what we were discussing in class on Tuesday. And I'm going to go as far as I did with the first class this morning. And then I'll stop. So uh, just give me a chance here to change my screens again. So the other day we were discussing the motion of charged particles in a magnetic field. And the expression that we had for the force in the charged particle in the magnetic field is like the following. I need to erase this board. And I want to say two things about this. And when we're writing this equation, I'm assuming there's no electric field and there's no gravitation field, okay? So I'm just looking at an isolated particle in a uniform magnetic field. Actually, this equation works whether or not the field is uniform. Now, when you put a charged particle in a magnetic field, in order for the charged particle to experience a magnetic force, it's got to be moving. But if you put a charged particle in an electric field, the charged particle, the electric field, doesn't need to be moving in order for it to experience a force. There's no V in this equation. The force on the charged particle in the electric field, right, yes will be either in the direction of the electric field or against the direction of the electric field. In the case of a charged particle in a magnetic field, V can't be zero. Furthermore, V has to have a component of its velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field. The force on the uh, charged particle is perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the velocity vector. And since F is always perpendicular to V, the direction of the velocity vector always changes. Can you think of an example where you've seen that before? Like in 205, where the force is always perpendicular to the velocity? an example. I know you I know you've seen this before. What would be an example where you you've actually experienced this? 
rotation. Yes, circular motion. Uniform circular motion. An object orbiting the Earth. An object in a roll, in a loop to loop in a roller coaster. The normal in, in a loop to loop, the normal force only changes the velocity of the object. Okay. So this magnetic force actually causes an object to go in a circular path. If the velocity vector is perpendicular to B, then you're going to get purely circular motion. If the velocity vector has a component parallel to B and a component perpendicular to B, then instead of getting circular motion, you're going to get helical motion, spiral motion. Okay. Of course, the math is for that is a little more complicated. Probably need a little bit of calc three to actually. Describe that motion. Okay. We're mainly going to focus on the case where V is perpendicular to B, or V is parallel to B. Well, if V is parallel to B, F is zero. So if the force causes circular motion, if F is perpendicular to V, that must mean that, mag that the force does no magnetic work. I'm sorry. The magnetic force does no work on a charged particle. Okay. Magnetic force does no work on a charged particle. zero. That means that the magnetic force does not change the velocity of the object. That means that the magnetic force will not change the kinetic energy of the object. I should say though that magnetic forces, although they don't do work on charged particles, they will do work on a dipole. Okay, so just be careful. So let me show you a simulation from MIT. They have a lot of nice simulations about uh, charged particles and magnetic fields. Oops, I clicked the wrong window. Here comes a charged particle. And the magnetic field is going in a circular path. One more time. There it is. I also have a hard time advancing to the next slide. Okay, here we go. Suppose that we have a charged particle in a magnetic field. And suppose that the, the velocity vector is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Then we're going to get purely circular motion. Let's let theta the angle between V and B be zero. So we get purely circular motion. It means when if I want to write the magnitude of this using the definition of the magnitude of the cross product, and it's going to be Q, B, B. And for, for our sake, instead of me writing all the absolute value signs, I'm just going to write it like this. 
I'm just being lazy. I won't put the arrowhead over these. And so these all represent magnitudes. Okay, so let's assume all these represent magnitudes. Then this force is causing circular motion. If it's causing circular motion, then the charged particle is experiencing a centripetal acceleration. And so that means according to Newton's second law, Q V V has to be equal to M E squared. If you solve for R, it gives you R equals M V over QB. So for a particular value, for a particular value of momentum, there's this, a, a particular value of R. There's a unique value of R for this product of M and V. So that means that if I have, let's see, where can I draw this? I'll do it here. If I have a charged particle entering a uniform magnetic field, and it has a particular value, m and v, this charged particle will exhibit circular motion. It's going, to, it's going to actually go through a particular radius for that product M and V. If I put a detector right there, if I put a detector right there, that particle will land there. Only those particles of this momentum will, will land there. So what this is saying is that the momentum selects this moment. I'm sorry. The magnetic field selects this momentum. And so we can say that the magnetic field acts as a momentum selector in this case. Okay? The magnetic field acts as a momentum selector. If you know the velocity, in other words, if a bunch of particles come in here and they all have the same velocity, then what's going to happen is only those particles of a particular mass will land here, and then it becomes a mass selector or a mass spectrometer. Okay. So the magnetic field is a, for a charged particle, magnetic field is a momentum selector. Because, it's, it, because R goes by this equation. There's a unique value of R for a particular value of the product of n times V. However, if we know V for all the particles, if we know they're all the same, then this magnetic field here, this setup, acts as a mass spectrometer or a mass selector. Only, ma only particles of a particular mass will land here, assuming all the particles coming in have the same V. Some of you folks have had chemistry. Have you talked about the mass selector or the mass spectrometer? You had Chem 1A, Chem 1B, or Chem 12A and 12B. You talked about the mass spectrometer? Yeah, we talked about it and did a couple of experiments. I'm sorry? Yeah, we talked about it. Okay, so. And I'll say a little bit more about this in class today. Oh, Professor. by the way, we can also solve this for V. Solve this for V. Uh, Q, V, R over, uh, over N. And since V is the angular velocity times R, we can write omega. It's Q, V over N. And the frequency at which you mix the circle is going to be this divided by 2 pi. So these are some equations involving uh, objects in the magnetic field, uh, charged particles in the magnetic field. 
Okay, so question for you folks. Wait, clicker's a good clicker question. I, I guess I could have made this into a poll. You have a, you have a drawing there with three charged particles in a magnetic field. Um, all the masses are equal. The magnetic field points into the board. And the question is, first of all, which one's going faster? And why, why is C going the fastest? Because it has the biggest radius, right? C is going the fastest because C has the biggest radius. Okay, next question. Is A positively charged or negatively charged, and why? Or in other words, which particles are positively charged, which particles are negatively charged? Basically, if I know, if I can figure out whether or not A is positively charged or negatively charged, then I know the answer to B and C. How do I know whether or not A is positively charged or negatively charged? A is going clockwise, right? In fact, C is going clockwise also. So the direction of motion looks like this. So A and C are going clockwise. How do I know whether or not A is A and C are positive or negative? What do I do? Well, let's take a look at the motion over here. What direction is the velocity vector over here? It's straight down. What direction is the magnetic field here? Well, it's into the board. And so let me draw my right-handed coordinate system here. Okay, so B is into the void. What's B cross B here? Let's see. I'm going to Use the right hand rule. I point my fingers in the direction of, of V. I got a I got a curl them towards B, which is into the board. I got to curl them, my fingers into the board, my thumb points to the right. So the right hand rule says that the force is to the right. The right hand rule says that at this point the force points away from the center of the circle. Any comments about that? Based on your knowledge of Physics 205, what does that tell you? Well, first of all, what is the direction of this neutral force? Which direction is the triple force? The weight or toward the center of the circle?
Anybody? It's directed toward center. This is saying it's moving away from the center of the circle. So what's wrong? Well, the right-hand rule is for a positively charged particle. This makes no physical sense. So that means that this must be a negative charge. If this were a negative charge, then this force vector points toward the center of the circle. So A and C are negative. If you apply the right hand rule to the to B, it'll work because it's a positively charged particle. Okay. Two more things, and then I will be done. Or three more things, sorry. Example, example of, uh, of this. And this is an important example. Van Allen belts. The solar winds produce um, these, these uh, charged particles that move very they move very fast. Some of them are electrons, and some of them are protons. Okay. And they come towards the Earth. These are fast-moving charged particles. If they were to be able to get into our atmosphere, our atmosphere, because of air resistance, would slow them down. That means you would have an acceleration. That acceleration, though, would cause the particles to radiate. That radiation would be bad for us. It would highly, it would, it would drastically increase rates of cancer. Okay. But the Earth's magnetic field keeps that from happening. The Earth's magnetic field causes them to go into a spiral of motion. So they stay well above the surface of the Earth. And as a result, we end up having two sets of belts, one due to positively charged particles and one due to negatively charged particles. The inner Van Allen belts, the closest of which are about 600 miles above the Earth, are due to protons, which you see as the purple ones, the closest they get is about 600, generally, on, on, uh, the closest on average they get is about 600 miles above the Earth. Of course, that depends on whether you have a solar flare on the, on the Sun. Okay. It depends on how much activity you have on the Sun. Okay. Uh, it, it really depends on the conditions, too, it, in, on the Earth. But on average, it's about the closest 600 miles. And those are protons. The average size of the belt is about maybe. 17, 1800 miles, somewhere in the middle of the inner Van Allen belt, runs uh, 1800 miles away from the Earth. The outer Van Allen belts are due to electrons. The lower end of the outer Van Allen belt is around 8100 miles above the Earth's surface. That's the blue that you see there. And the Earth's magnetic field keeps them out that far away, which is good, because that, that radiation would be bad for us. Now, some of these particles do get into our atmosphere, and they do interact with the molecules in our atmosphere, much in the same way that they, the um, electrons interact with the gases in the tube I showed you the other day. And as a result, when the electron, when these uh, particles interact with the gases in our atmosphere, the, the gases get excited, and then when they, uh, they go back to original state, they give off light. This light can be seen 
up in the north and, and, and down in the south. They're called the Aurora Borealis and the Aurora Australis. So that's where you see an application of this idea. Okay, I need to talk about two more, uh, I'm sorry, a couple more things because I did this in the, in the uh, other lab. So I, I want to continue this, so I apologize if I'm a little bit older. But this is being recorded. Suppose we have crossed electric and magnetic fields. Okay, suppose we have crossed electric and magnetic fields. So, let's say we have two plates producing an electric field. This is positive, this is negative. The electric field then points straight down. And we have a magnetic field that is directed into the plane of the screen. And we have a charged particle Let's make a positively charge, moving to the right. We want this charged particle to go straight through this, this plate without going undeflected. In order for that to happen, the force through the electric field has got to be equal to the for, equal and opposite to the force through the electric field. And we're letting B be perpendicular to V. And E is perpendicular to B, so that if I write the full Lorentz force, and I write it in terms of magnitudes. I put a minus sign here because these forces are going to be equal and opposite. I want to set this equal to zero. What should be the conditions on E and B so that the velocity, the particle goes straight through? Well, this thing in parentheses has to be zero. So if we satisfy this condition, then the particle will go straight through undeflected. So let's see if the magnetic force is upward. Obviously, if f equals q times z, then this electric force is downward. What about the magnetic force? Let me draw my right hand coordinates just on that. So the magnetic force is into the board. I'm sorry, the magnetic field into the board. He is to the right. Which way is V cross E? Pull my fingers in the direction of V cross towards B, my thumb is upward, upward, the magnetic force is upward. If E and B, if this, if, if um, E and B are the right combination given by this expression, then the force on that charged particle is going to be zero. The particle will go through undeflected. What about those particles that don't have the right velocity? What's going to happen? Well, those particles that don't meet this criteria, they're going to get the either deflected upward or downward. So how do I make just these particles coming straight through? Well, what do I do is I put a plate here with a little hole right in the middle. 
And those particles that go through undeflected will go straight through that hole. Those particles that get deflected will hit this plate. And so now I'm selecting particles of a particular velocity. That's called a velocity selector. And that was important. It's also called a beam filter. That was important when Thomson measured the charge to mass ratio of the electron. Charge, uh, Thomson used a tube like that that you see in the figure. What Thomson did was he sent a beam of electrons down the tube to measure the velocity. He turned on a magnetic field so that the particles don't get deflected. He turned on a magnetic field, adjusted the magnetic field so that the particles went straight through undeflected. The ratio of the electric field to the magnetic field gave him the velocity of the particles. Then he turned off the electric field and let the particles deflect. And he measured delta Y. How did he measure delta Y? The tube on the end had phosphor. When the electrons hit the phosphor, it glows. And so you can see where the you can see the electrons landing up where they landed. And then you can measure this delta Y. So he measured the velocity, he measured delta Y, he knew the length of the plates, he knew the distance from the end of the plates to the screen, and then he was able to measure charge to mass ratio of 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. And you should be able to derive the expression for delta y. In fact, I, I leave it. I, I, I have it here. So for per, for practice, do not turn this in. Ignore the last statement in that slide. Um, you can derive that expression. You should be able to derive that expression. Normally, we do a lab on the CRT tube where you have to derive that expression, but since we're online, we can't do that. But you should know how to derive that expression. Maybe that would make for a good exam question. Okay. So I'm going to stop here. Any questions? Concerns? So my advice to you, get started on the lab right away. Oh, one more thing. Um, if I forgot to mention it. There's an app called Firefox. It's listed on the screen on the left. Download it onto your phone. It has a feature where it can measure magnetic fields. You can actually do a lot, some of your physics tool five labs with it. Okay, so download Firefox. Put it on your phone. It has, it has the capability, it gives your phone the capability of measuring magnetic fields, which is going to be important when you're building the, mag, when you're building the motor and testing it. Okay. Nobody have any other questions? I have a quick question about the um, the past lap that we that did today. Yeah. Um. So for part um, one second. Uh, for part three. Uh. So for for table uh, two and three. Um. You said that we were supposed to use a a big multimeter. But I don't know why mine wasn't really, like, it was only giving me zero. Um, I, like, checked the fuse and everything, and it, it wasn't burnt, so I don't know why. So I just ended up using the small multimeter to make the measurements. Is that okay? Which measurements are you talking about? Um, the, the current, the, sorry, the, 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 the voltage. And how are you measuring the voltage, the current through AC, then? Um, uh, wait. So, oh, I think, oh, no, 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 I think uh, I try to use the, um, I was using the small multimeter to measure the, the current, and I don't know, like, for... 
the A A S current, and then it. I don't know why it wasn't working, but it was ma- it was matching the the current through A C for some reason. I don't know. Like I tried all the settings and stuff, and it didn't really work. Okay, I'm getting confused. So you me- you use a small multimeter to measure I A C, right? <laughs> Now I'm confused too. Give me one second. Uh, cause. Oh. Yes. So I was using the uh, big multimeter to measure. Sorry. Sorry, I'm just getting my lap notes. Mm. Okay, so small. Yeah, so I use the the small multimeter for a. C. Okay. And then. Or off the best. Or did I change it? I guess I'll just have to redo that part because I did not take notes of which one I used for that. Um, for eyes of us. I'm assuming I use I I just remember there was something that wasn't really working. Um, you gotta use whatever you use. This has to be here the whole time. Right. So then you um, have to use the other meter to measure do all the other measurements. Mm-hmm. Right. So whatever See, is here. I, I have I I have three multimeters, and that's why I I can't remember which one I used because okay, I think three, okay. That's I mean as long as long as you have you always have one here. Then you use the other multimeter to measure everything. That's fine. Yeah, I just I just have like two small ones and then the big one. So I have like the the big one and small one that was provided by uh, the lab kit, and then I have another small one. So I I can't remember. It just I wrote small DMM on 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 the lab, but um I just can't remember which small multimeter it was. So the big ones not measuring current. Um no, but I don't know because it was measuring. It's, I know the, the fuse not burned because I, I tested it, but I don't know why it wasn't. It, it was just giving me zero. Was it measuring voltage? Uh, yeah. Was it measuring voltage but not current? Were you at the right setting? I, yeah, I think so because I, I tried it multiple times and I even had like, someone check and it, it wasn't working. So we need to exchange that, right? You want to contact Tyler and, and, and get an exchange. Mm-hmm. Sorry? Contact Tyler to exchange it. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, Sounds good. Yeah. It. You're going to need that multimeter. Okay. Especially right. especially for the last two labs. You, that one's really important. Because a small okay. multimeter is useless for the last the last lab. All right. So then uh, I just need to email Tyler and ask for a, let you exchange it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Other questions? Yeah, if you have a bad multimeter, we're gonna have to swap that out for you guys. So, because for that last one, that big one has to work. Because the little one doesn't measure AC current. Okay, that little multimeter won't measure AC current. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here.